get things started. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We're really excited for this opportunity to share some of the work that CDC's Division of Overdose Prevention is doing to support public health and public safety partnerships to address drug overdose. My name is Jessica Wolf, and I'm the team lead for CDC's public health and public safety team, and I'll be serving as the moderator for the session today. I'm really happy to be joined by my colleagues from our public health and public safety team, and I'll just briefly um, take a minute to introduce each of them. Stephanie Rubel is a health scientist at CDC, and she has more than 15 years of experience as a federal public health program consultant and contractor working with CDC and other federal agencies. She received her MPH from Emory with a focus on behavioral science and health education. Stephanie created the Public Health and Safety Teams or FAST toolkit that she'll be discussing today. And she's also the CDC lead for the Opioid Rapid Response Program, which is a partnership with CDC and the HHS Office of Inspector General to mitigate the impact on patients when there's a pain clinic closure. Dr. Sasha Mittal is also a health scientist in CDC's Division of Overdose Prevention. She has more than a decade of experience conducting research, program design, and evaluation related to harm reduction. She has a doctorate in behavioral sciences and a master in public health in global health from Emory. Prior to this position, Sasha conducted research on trends, um, use, and access to medication-assisted treatment among people who co-use prescription opioid and, uh, and heroin. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Nancy Worthington. She's also a health scientist at CDC. She's a medical anthropologist by training. And prior to working at CDC, um, Dr. Worthington taught anthropology and science studies at Fordham University, Miami, Miami University, and Wesleyan University. She studied surgical humanitarianism in Honduras and coordinated a needle exchange and naloxone distribution program in New York City. She has a PhD in sociomedical sciences and an MPH in research, both from Columbia University. So I am pleased and honored to be here um, with these three amazing women. And with that, I will now turn it over to Stephanie to get us started. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Jessica. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll, I guess I'll just say next, next slide as we go along. Thank you. Okay, so this is a photo of mission control for Apollo 13 in April 1970. I'm going to let you in on something. Um, I'm a little bit obsessed with Apollo 13. Yes, the movie, but really the entire story of Apollo 13 fascinates me. And not because I'm a huge NASA enthusiast. Uh, I think what fascinates me is that it truly was a disaster of monumental proportion, seemingly out of the control of those at the helm. And it was overcome by a large number of people, many pictured here, and the brave astronauts on the spacecraft. For those of you unfamiliar with Apollo 13, um, in April of 1970, we had three astronauts who were supposed to be landing on the moon encounter a series of unfortunate and unforeseen challenges, such that for six days, uh, the three astronauts Astronauts were stuck out in space while about 100,000 people here on Earth were working together tirelessly to try to bring them home safely. You may be wondering, uh, why is she talking about Apollo 13? Well, bear with me and uh, keep this in the back of your mind. And I want you to think about the overdose epidemic as a big monumental challenge that feels very much out of our control. Um, one that none of us can solve alone and that a lot of people are involved in trying to solve because that is what it is. Now, why haven't public health and public safety traditionally partnered? Well, to state the obvious, public health and public safety are very different. We tend to see the world differently. We tend to approach problems differently. On one hand, we have public health scientists and prevention program specialists. On the other hand, we have public safety, which includes law enforcement and other first responders, as well as criminal justice. This being the Law Enforcement and Public Health Conference, I'll focus on our law enforcement partners. I don't need to tell you that law enforcement folks are incredibly tactical and operational. By definition, as first responders, they need to act fast. They have procedures they follow that are intended to help make unsafe situations safer and more manageable so they can enforce laws and keep people safe. As part of these procedures, 
They have law enforcement sensitive data and rules about not sharing information that may compromise investigations and prosecution. In contrast, public health brings a very different perspective. We are generally several, sometimes many steps removed from the front line. We look at data and statistics and science and we study phenomena so that we can develop and test interventions and only after we know they'll work do we tend to intervene. That may be viewed as a luxury to those on the front line who don't have the option of not responding when the calls come in. Another difference is that law enforcement follows a true chain of command. Whereas in public health, uh, we tend to be quite um, inter interdisciplinary. In fact, we need to be interdisciplinary because of the many different issues we work on and because of our relative distance from the front line. Many people in public health aren't physicians, but we need physicians to work with us. So we are used to working in teams of people with backgrounds in everything from medicine to social work to anthropology to law and so on. We rely heavily on our partners who are the direct service providers to help us study, interpret, and develop interventions. Historically though, we haven't really tried very often, not always, but to partner with public safety, um, more so in terms of emergency situations like the anthrax attacks in the early 2000s. And when we have partnered, by all accounts, it's been successful and important. Um, we know that many people in law enforcement are tired of bearing much of the burden by being on the front lines of this opioid overdose crisis. Not only is it incredibly demanding of their already stressful jobs, it is also quite distressing to see so many overdoses and deaths. Public health must leverage those on the front line, but we also must recognize that those on the front line need more help and support to be able to make a difference. Now, if we look a little bit closer at our cultures, um, well, it turns out we have more in common than you may think. So next slide. I showed you a photo of mission control. This is a photo of a CompStat meeting in New York City. CompStat is a crime reduction management system which uses timely crime statistics to push precinct commanders to greater awareness and command of the immediate on the ground crime situation. It's short for compare statistics. At these meetings, law enforcement personnel identify crime patterns, select tactics, and allocate resources on the spot. Statistics are regularly revisited as a group so that precincts are held accountable for making progress in reducing crime. Comstat has since become the norm in most major police precincts. And these meetings are lauded as effectively increasing communication and accountability. In 2011, New York City began applying this model to overdose prevention, bringing together diverse stakeholders from public health, behavioral health, mental health, law enforcement, criminal justice, fire and EMS, and social services. They called it, and they still do, the RxStat initiative. Next slide. The public health and safety teams toolkit is modeled after RxStat. If you compare the principles of CompStat or RxStat with public health strategies, you can see how well they align. Essentially, you can compare across this table and what we're all asking are simple questions. What do we know? What should we do? Then we wanna act quickly and we wanna know if it works so we can do more of it. And if not, we change or improve what we're doing. Next slide. Building on the lessons learned from RxStat and other cross-sector collaborations focused on overdose prevention, in 2019, the CDC partnered with the CDC Foundation to develop a toolkit that would be scalable and adaptable to all jurisdictions and that would support data-driven overdose prevention through public health and public safety partnerships. The toolkit became the Public Health and Safety Team or FAST toolkit. And there are four guiding principles for these teams, which are fundamental to their success. Each one has a North Star to reduce overdose deaths. That's their common goal. Opioid use disorder is recognized as a chronic treatable disease and overdoses are recognized as being preventable. There's responsible use of data and a focus on continuous improvement. Next slide. 
The toolkit is not a step-by-step how-to per se, although through pilots, we've found that sometimes jurisdictions really want the step-by-step, but this toolkit is meant to be scalable, so it offers guideposts and we're developing now. We are including a few step-by-step guide processes move jurisdictions from data to implementation. One of the guideposts in the toolkit is that all collaboration should serve at least one of three purposes, developing a shared understanding of the overdose crisis, optimizing capacity to address the crisis, and sharing accountability for making progress. The seven steps shown on this slide are meant to be how a FAST tackles the crisis at the local level. Uh, but we're focusing on steps one through three. Um, what do we know? You share data and information with one another across sectors. What else do we need to know? You try to identify knowledge gaps. And what can we do to innovate and problem solve? That is essentially the FAST toolkit in its simplest terms. So we've been piloting the toolkit to see how jurisdictions interpret its content uh, and apply it to real task forces already working on overdose prevention. Uh, we ground everything in question format so that the focus is on data for data for, for specific purposes. Um, Simply sharing data does not sh solve problems by itself. Data dashboards are wonderful, but on their own, they don't solve problems. People solve problems. And that's why we ground everything in this question format. What question are you trying to answer and what actions depend on the answers? Next slide. Okay, now back to Apollo 13's mission control for a moment. The flight director for Apollo 13 was a man named Gene Krantz. And his leadership in that role was critical to bringing the three astronauts home safely. One of the things he is quoted as saying is, let's work the problem. Let's not make things worse by guessing. That's fast. We use the data and information we have to make data-informed decisions. So these are activities that can be carried out by a fast. Um, examples of collaborative learning, an EMS chief of operations shared a presentation he gave at a local university about the current overdose crisis from the perspective of EMS. This presentation, unlike the data he typically shared at meetings, provided historical 10-year trends on suspected overdoses and their geographical locations, revealing that suspected overdoses had increased significantly since 2010, but were really clustered in specific parts of the city. Another jurisdiction embraced the idea of bringing guest speakers to their meetings, including state level partners working on drug trafficking trends. Um, a takeaway from another pilot, collaborative learning has provided a broader, deeper understanding of the work folks do, their unique perspectives, and the resources that are available to the community. All three um, of our pilot jurisdictions are interested in starting overdose fatality reviews to be able to map the pathway individuals follow and seek to fill service gaps and address missed opportunities to intervene. For collaborative inter interpretation of data, a timely example was when COVID started. Rather quickly, there were some increases in overdoses and being able to rapidly gain a complete picture was very important. Uh, FAST stakeholders got together for a meeting and identified what each partner was seeing. Visits to the ED for medications for opioid use disorder seemed to be down, as were intakes at residential treatment programs. They realized people who were using drugs were avoiding all of the available services because they were afraid of COVID exposure. In fact, the facilities were open and staffed and were taking extreme COVID safety precautions. As a result of having this meeting, they quickly were able to communicate that um, that the safety precautions were in place and that facilities were open to the broader group of stakeholders who could then share that information with people they encountered post overdose. Again, they were working the problem. Next slide. Again, to consider how the astronauts on board Apollo 13 ended up using the part of the spacecraft designed to land on the moon. Um, to return to Earth when they were forced to abandon a command module. Gene Krantz is quoted as saying, 
I don't care about what anything was designed to do. I care about what it can do. This is about problem solving. This is one of the hardest parts of the work. What Gene Kranz was asking his team of astrophysicists to do was to overcome something called functional fixedness. Members of a FAST need to be able to think about how the resources available to their own sector may be useful to others. Uh, EMS's heat map uh, of suspected overdoses and naloxone administration around um, a particular geographic location in a community led to the County Drug and Alcohol Authority and the Health Bureau in a jurisdiction to propose the idea of contacting um, the motels and hotels that were in that corridor in the area to stock them with naloxone and train um, the front desk workers. Um, what was shared at the FAST meeting was that the exact location um, was that exact location of the hotels and motels along that corridor. They hadn't been able to piece that together until law enforcement shared and EMS shared that that's exactly where the source of the uh, problem was. Another example, 911 overdoses shared with probation and parole so that officers could provide direct outreach to offer recovery and treatment services. This is about optimizing capacity. You have officers checking in on individuals regularly, individuals who don't want to go back to jail and whose chances of overdose are extremely high immediate, immediately post-release from correctional settings. They're visibly struggling having just had an overdose. The number one predictor of an overdose is a previous overdose. This was an intervention opportunity that only works if the information is shared for this specific purpose. And that was done in a jurisdiction. Cross training is another example. A training on the principles of methamphetamine use disorder designed really for medical professionals and those working in behavioral health was modified and offered to an entire FAST, all of the partners, the data analysts, the public health, behavioral health, law enforcement, and criminal justice partners. This can be very helpful to highlight that even if you only touch one specific part of an issue, you're really part of a much larger ecosystem working on the crisis. These opportunities can take people out of their echo chamber and open their eyes as well as their minds to other perspectives. There are other new and expanded programs and strategies that emerged. In one of the pilot jurisdictions, the FAST was able to apply for and was awarded a grant to fund their crisis response unit, United in Harm Reduction. This expanded program will be using a combination of spatial mapping through OD map and social network analysis to identify high risk and high influence individuals for proactive targeted interventions in the city. Resources will include linkages to care, including access to safe stations, MAT, physical care, mental health care, food, housing, et cetera, and leave behind kits, naloxone, overdose prevention materials and training and community resource listings as well as fatality prevention resources, like warm weather gear. Next slide. This is all about monitoring your progress, celebrating wins, as well as looking for areas of improvement. Look for what's working and build upon it. While you're busy focusing on problems, stop, stop and look at what's working and build upon it as well. Another quote attributed to Gene Kranz, although this time I think it was only said in the movie, he said, let's look at this thing from a standpoint of status. What do we have on this spacecraft that's good? And everything else seemed to be breaking. Why do I keep bringing up Apollo 13 and the flight director? Well, what if the crisis is our Apollo 13? Solving this crisis takes fortitude and leadership like Gene Kranz had, and the leadership and methods Mission Control used are the exact same qualities and methods needed for public health and law enforcement to work together on this crisis. Don't guess, you have data, so use it. Work the problem together, solve the problem together. You must be willing to innovate, try new things, and learn new things. Don't forget to look for what's working and build upon it. And the last reason 
I wanted to mention Apollo 13 and Jean Kranz is because we have seen that truly effective leadership within each sector is critical to solving problems, but really the most effective leaders inspire everyone else in the room to think creatively, be innovative, and make progress toward a desired outcome. So I'll leave you with this quote because I believe everyone in, in attending this conference is either a leader like Jean Kranz or an invaluable member of Mission Control. You cannot operate in this room unless you believe you are Superman. And whatever happens, you're capable of solving the problem. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, so now I will take a few minutes just to share with you all about the overdose response strategy, which is CDC's um, largest public health and public safety partnership. And um, it's a partnership between the Office of National Drug Control Policy and the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program. So the overdose response strategy was started um, actually back in 2015, and it was started by five high intensity drug trafficking area programs across 15 states. Um, Many of you, uh, I imagine, are probably familiar with the HIDA program, but in case you're not, it's a grant program funded out of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, or ONDCP, and um, it, it is charged with interagency collaboration and information sharing to disrupt and dismantle drug trafficking organizations. The directors of those five original HIDAs really embraced the idea that we are not going to arrest our way out of the opioid crisis and decided that they needed to take a different approach. And so that new and different approach was to find a way for HIDA to partner with public health and to do this kind of cross-sector collaboration and coordination. And uh, CDC seemed like a, a natural partner and a good fit. And so we officially became involved in the program in 2017. I think um, just reflecting on Stephanie's remarks, um, I was thinking that the, the ORS really embodies the three qualities that Stephanie touched on with the Apollo 13 reference. Uh, trying to work the problem together across these various federal agencies, um, solving the problem together, and then trying to be willing to innovate, to try new things and to learn new things, to look at what's working and then build upon that. So CDC, HIDA, and ONDCP decided to, um, to build this innovative solution uh, through the overdose response strategy. And year after year, we've been able to build upon what, uh, what's working in that partnership. So the focus of the ORS is to bring knowledge, data, and science, um, sorry, to bridge knowledge, data, and science gaps between public health and public safety that inevitably will impact the success of overdose prevention strategies and to implement and enhance programs that are at that intersection or nexus of public health and public safety that specifically support the needs of those at risk of overdose. And we do all of this with the mission of helping communities reduce fatal and non-fatal drug overdoses. So we're very specific in our focus. Uh, Stephanie was talking about the, the North Star and coming to an agreement on what is the focus of your collaboration or partnership. And, and the ORS, our focus is preventing drug overdose. And so everything that we do should be directly related to that mission. So the goal of the ORS is very specific, but the methods that we use and that we endorse and that we encourage states to use are pretty broadly defined. Um, we focus on increasing data and information sharing and adopting evidence-based interventions that are um, at the intersection of public health and public safety to prevent overdose. So we encourage, encourage our state and local partners to really tailor the specific methods or activities or programs that they use to address the ORS mission, um, tailor those to their specific needs within the state. So the overdose response strategy achieves this mission through state teams that are made up of public health analysts or PHAs and drug intelligence officers or DIOs. DIOs are typically physically located at either um, a HIDA or a state fusion center. Uh, most of them have uh, our former uh, law enforcement um, officials or professionals. We have former DEA agents that are drug intelligence officers, former state troopers, some former chiefs of police. Um, PHAs, on the other hand, typically split, split their time between the state health department and the HIDA or fusion center. Um, and most PHAs have a strong public health background, um, but uh, are sort of varying in their expertise. We have um, PHAs that have a strong um, epi-surveillance background, uh, while others are more focused on 
uh, community coordination and outreach. Um, but the bottom line is that the PHAs and DIOs are tasked with working together in their state to bridge these gaps between public health and public safety, and they really form the foundation of this program. So the map that you see here shows the scope and reach of the ORS. The program has expanded significantly, as you can see from those original 15 states and five HIDAs. So the states in the darker blue here are places where right now there's a funding for both a public health analyst and a drug intelligence officer. And then the lighter blue states are those that for now have just received funding from HIDA for a drug intelligence officer. Um, they don't currently have a public health analyst, but our hope and goal is to make this a national program with a public health analyst and the drug intelligence officer funded in every state within the next year. Um, I may have mentioned, but the drug intelligence officer positions are funded by the HIDA program through ONDCP, and the public health analyst positions are funded by CDC through the CDC Foundation. So these three buckets that you see here just very broadly represent the kinds of activities that PHAs and DIOs are engaged in. So sharing data systems, um, but you know, Stephanie touched on this as well, not only sharing data, but taking that one or two steps further and moving that data into action. Then based on the data, implementing other um, you know, promising and evidence-based strategies that are at the intersection of public health and public safety, and then evaluating those strategies to help build evidence base for what works. And in many ways, the ORS team, state teams are taking the FAST principles that Stephanie discussed and really putting them to, into action on the ground within their state partners. So what, is, um, what does this look like in practice? So just to give, a, I guess, um, some more concrete examples of the kind of, uh, kinds of work that our PHAs and DIOs are engaged in. So we have um, quite a few state teams that are working on scaling up ODMAP. Um, Stephanie mentioned ODMAP. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this overdose detection mapping application program that was developed by the Washington Baltimore HIDA. The PHAs and DIOs are working on um, scaling up ODMAP across their state, then bringing together law enforcement and public health agencies to develop a plan or protocol for how to respond when overdose spikes are identified through ODMAP. We have state teams that are designing and implementing naloxone distribution programs in correctional settings and detention centers across their states. We have some that are working on identifying counties that have particularly high rates of overdose and then working with local police departments or sheriffs in those areas to create a pre-arrest diversion program um, to divert individuals from the criminal justice system and instead link them to care and treatment. We also have PHAs and DIOs that are bringing together behavioral health, public health, and public safety in the state to work on a number of different issues. Um, but one example is to design a training that addresses compassion fatigue among first responders who are repeatedly responding to overdose calls. I think importantly, PHAs and DIOs also create this really incredible network of individuals with a um, finger on the pulse of what's happening locally and at the state level in terms of drug overdose. So in some ways we've seen they've been able to act um, almost like an early warning system that can identify some of these emerging, um, emerging issues, emerging substances that may not have made it to the national level yet. Um, we recently had PHAs and DIOs who were instrumental in identifying possible overdose clusters related to counterfeit oxycodone pills that contain fentanyl across multiple states. So ORS state teams should absolutely be seen as a resource that you all can access within your state um, to enhance the work that you're already doing within the public health and public safety space or to create new connections that would help um, fill a gap in your efforts to address overdoses. The website on this slide is kind of a um, one-stop shop for all things ORS, so you can sign up for our monthly newsletter here. Um, you can get the contact information for the PHA and DIO in your state, and you can feel free to reach out to them directly. We also have a number of tools and resources um, that we've developed to help foster these public health and public safety partnerships, and you can find those on this website as well. And you'll hear about some of those in more detail during the next presentation. So thank you very much, and I will pass it on to Sasha. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so I'm excited to talk about one of the initiatives that we work on every year through the Overdose Response Strategy, or the ORS, called the Cornerstone Project. Next slide. 
So cornerstone projects are designed to answer a common question that exists between both public health and public safety partners. They address shared informational needs and produce actionable findings that then can be used by public health and public safety. They also create purposeful collaborations between our PHAs and DIOs in, in states, and they take a state and a regional approach to advancing promising practices. Next slide. So this figure shows how the process of developing and then implementing cornerstone projects. So every year, project ideas are submitted by members of the ORF community. This includes PHAs and DIOs within states, HIDA directors, and the CDC staff. HIDA directors and CDC leadership then identify the topic that is most relevant at this point in time. Other considerations for choosing a topic is that the corresponding project and methods are feasible and that the PHA and DIOs are able to implement the project within a relatively short amount of time, so like a month or two. Next, the project is designed. This means that guidance and tools for completing the project are drafted and approved by the ORS leadership. Then the full project is introduced to PHAs and DIOs who spend the next one to two months implementing, implementing the project or collecting all the information relevant to the project. CDC scientists then provide technical assistance by, with the data analysis and interpreting the findings. And finally, a product is put together that outlines the methods, the findings, and implications that shared with the ORS community and more broadly. So all of this to say is that throughout the entire project, both public health and public safety partners are involved in the conception and then the finalization of these projects. Next slide, please. So to date, four cornerstone projects have been conducted, and these years correspond to when most of the data collection was conducted or the information gathering was conducted. So in 2016, the project aimed to examine the threat of fentanyl within the drug supply. In 2017, it aimed to assess law enforcement knowledge of, experience with, and attitudes towards overdose response strategies and 911 Good Samaritan laws. In 2019, it was to identify promise, promising strategies for public safety led programs that link people with opioid use disorder to evidence based care. And the last one in 2019 aimed to examine jail-based overdose prevention strategies. We did not implement a project last year in 2020 due to COVID and a lot of our staff working on that response, but we're in the beginning stages of planning for the next project. Today, I'm gonna focus on the implications of the last three projects that we conducted. Next slide, please. So for the Good Samaritan Law Project, the aim was to assess law enforcement knowledge of, experience with, and attitudes towards overdose response efforts and implementation of Good Samaritan Laws. This was done by connecting with police department leadership, then sending an online survey link for them to distribute to their patrol officers. It resulted in completion of surveys by almost 3,000 patrol officers in 20 states, and the distribution of the respondents by state appears on this map. You can see all those states in blue. From this project, we developed state-specific reports with findings and recommendations that were shared back to each participating state. In realizing the potential impact of sharing aggregate findings or the more broad findings of the project, a manuscript was also developed um, and that was published. And you can see the citation for that also on this slide. So I'll describe some of those findings, those broader findings now. Next slide, please. Findings on experience with and knowledge of overdose response have important implications for naloxone carry policies among law enforcement, provision of training to law enforcement, and the need to improve knowledge of Good Samaritan laws, both among law enforcement and the public. 
of all survey respondents, 72% had responded to an overdose call within the, in the last six months, so a vast majority of them. And of these, 85% of those respondents work in a department that carries naloxone. So this means that 15% or more than one in six of the patrol officer surveys work in departments that don't carry naloxone. And these are folks that are responding to overdose calls. While most or 91% have received training on overdose response, 60% indicated that they benefit from additional training on aspects of overdose response in their state and their state's Good Samaritan law. Again, almost all of them, so 93% knew that their state had a Good Samaritan law, but much fewer were familiar with the provisions of that law and specific protections against arrest and charges. Next slide. Probably the most striking finding from this survey was regarding the relationship between overdose response and at general attitudes towards overdose response efforts. So the survey collected information on the number of overdose responses in the last six months, and that is presented on the y-axis with more results further, or more response further out to the right. Uh, the survey also collected information on endorsement of overdose response efforts, such as training, education, and use of naloxone. And each respondent then received a score of their endorsement of overdose response efforts response efforts. So a higher score or for, um, higher up on the y-axis indicates a higher endorsement or more positive attitudes towards overdose response efforts. So as you can see from this figure, the more experience that a patrol officer had with overdose response, the lower their score was. This really suggested to us compassion fatigue or burnout among these patrol officers which has been documented among other first responders experiencing repeated exposure to trauma. When we talk about actionable findings, this is exactly what we're talking about. These findings highlight the need for interventions that identify and address compassion fatigue among first responders, something that both public health and public safety partners can address through the ORS. Next slide, please. I'm gonna move on to our 2018 project on linkage to care. The aim of this project was to identify promising linkage to care practices at the intersection of public health and public safety um, by describing existing public safety led programs, linking people with opioid use disorder to evidence-based care within the ORS. When we say evidence-based care, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> evidence-based care, what we're really talking about is access to medications for opioid use disorder. Um, so PHAs and DIOs identified one program from each of these five categories on that bar chart in their state. Uh, then they surveyed program staff and where possible observed the program's implementation. To be included, programs had to facilitate linkage to evidence-based mm -hmm. care, so not just a referral, but really a linkage or a warm handoff. They had to include voluntary participation of those programs and offer individualized treatment plans. One report was generated for the project which aggregates all the findings. And data were collected from the following types of programs. And that bar chart shows you the number of states contributing information on each program type. Um, so we had pre-arrest diversion programs where first responders encounter an individual committing a crime and initiate a process linking that person to services in lieu of an arrest. We had um, drug courts where social and treatment services are integrated with judicial processes, post-release from incarceration in li linkage to treatment programs, post-overdose outreach, which is also called meet and checks, where um, public safety gets information on recent overdose victims, and conduct an in-person follow-up. And then finally, safe stations, where it's usually fire departments, but in some cases, police stations um, offer services where people with opioid use disorder can present and receive immediate care. Next slide. The assessment of these linkage to care programs and identification um, 
identified the following recommendations, which could be considered by program planners. So first, we need more evidence on how public safety-led programs can effectively link people by conducting program evaluations. Second, not to lose sight of overdose prevention in the push for treatment. So this includes providing overdose prevention education and the lock zone at each encounter. Third, provide training on addiction and recovery to all staff involved in programs. Fourth, use multi multidisciplinary teams that involve health providers in decision making. Fifth, um, appropriate, appro appropriately support staff involved in these projects, such as peer specialists who frequently help facilitate linkages and could experience high burnout. Six, provide linkage to treatment that tailors to individual needs. And seventh, reduce individual barriers to treatment, so things like insurance status and geographical loca location. Next slide. So finally, I'm gonna to touch on the 2019 project. The aim of the project was to describe the scope of jail-based services for people with opioid use disorder and advance implementation of these strategies to reduce overdose risk. The four services that we looked at were screening for substance use disorder, overdose education and naloxone distribution, linkage to care upon release, and maintenance medication-assisted treatment, or MAT. In each state, PHAs and drug intelligence officers identified counties with the highest burden in terms of opioid overdose death. They identified two jails willing to participate in the project, ideally one that provided MAT for maintenance and one that did not. They conducted interviews with the jail medical directors or other leadership in those two jails. And then they disseminated an online survey to all correctional staff in those jails. In total, information was gathered from 36 jails in 20 states, and interpreting the information gathered in the project, along with the existing evidence on overdose prevention in jails, we put together a toolkit guiding the implementation of jail-based jail overdose prevention strategies. Next slide, please. Despite evidence that implementation of these services reduces overdose risk substantially, we know from the literature that many jails struggle to provide these, pro these services. So the real benefit of this project was to provide concrete examples of the way that jails are overcoming some common implementation challenges to implementing these services. This report lists those challenges and ways jail leadership are troubleshooting them. And here's um, a table summarizing some of those recommendations for each service type. So we see for screening, screening, universal and immediate screening is recommended for overdose education and naloxone distribution. Again, early and regular trainings and in-person trainings were prioritized. For linkage to care, um, there were some, there's some advice from, from jails doing these programs on enrolling um, individuals in Medicaid and employing peer specialists. And then finally, for maintenance, medication and assisted treatment, again, universal enrollment and some other supports that could be provided. Next slide. So I'm going to end with just from our perspective, what facilitates to the success of these unique projects? Um, the first is that they embrace the various skill sets of the people involved. And I think this touches on a lot of what Stephanie mentioned is that we, we use the best from both, both fields. So those with public health training get to employ data collection and analysis skills, while those with public safety backgrounds get to use their investigative skills. Second, we leverage connections and relationships from both sectors. It's unlikely that public health analysts alone would be able to gain access to patrol officers or jails, but response rates have generally been high with these projects because public safety partners are the ones opening doors and facilitating these relationships. Next, these projects are time-bound, meaning that they're not allowed to drag on, and ample warning is given to PHAs and DIOs. Um, so they can reserve time to complete the project. And they're given lots of support from start to finish. 
And then finally, both in the process and outcome of completing these projects, the focus is on action with the ultimate goal of improving overdose prevention and response efforts. Based on the success of these programs, we suggest that states and jurisdictions think about how public health and public safety partners can come together and identify and address common knowledge gaps. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Nancy, to discuss another initiative within the overdose response strategy. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Sasha. Hi, everyone. So we'll end our panel today by describing the ORS pilot projects, another major ORS activity through which We've developed additional tools and resources that may be relevant to you. Um, earlier in the presentation, we said the ORS is driven by a mission to help communities reduce drug overdose, and that one main focus is the implementation and enhancement of programs at the nexus of public health and public safety that support the needs of those at risk of overdose. So the pilot projects are funded overdose prevention programs that embody this mission and focus. They complement the cornerstone projects that Sasha just described in several ways, whereas the cornerstone projects answer a common question, pilot projects address a shared public health service gap, whereas cornerstone projects address a shared informational need, pilot projects help build evidence for innovative and promising strategies, whereas cornerstone projects are implemented at the regional or national level, that is, they involve all ORS states, Pilot projects are implemented at the community level based on a competitive application process. About five to eight projects are funded each funding cycle, and they are always done in partnership with at least one community partner, uh, such as a health department, hospital, police department, or EMS. Uh, like cornerstone projects, they are carried out annually and they enhance purposeful collaboration across public health and public safety. Cornerstone projects are CDC funded, through the National Association of County and City Health Officials, or NHO. Next slide, please. So the process starts with a request for applications announced by NHO. All ORS states are eligible to apply as long as they have a PHA in place and their local partner, their community partner, collaborates across sectors. So if they are a health department, they collaborate with public safety. Applications are then received and critically reviewed for strength, feasibility, grounding in science, even if not evidence-based. And once awards are made, CDC and NATO provide additional support through monthly check-in calls and document reviews of all project-related materials, things like implementation plans, evaluation plans, logic models, and so on. We also create space for sites to learn from one another in a multi-day conference or remotely by phone. And at the end of the grant period, the sites submit final reports describing their evaluation findings and any programmatic tools they have developed that could benefit others. So operating procedures, educational materials, pre-post-test surveys, tools that we share more widely. Next slide. The first request for applications was in 2018. So to date, there have been three funding cycles, 14 projects funded in 13 states, and four projects that have been awarded funding more than once, owing to the success of their work. Awards are in three categories, uh, planning grants, implementation grants, and continuation awards, each of which is associated with a different funding amount. Next slide. All 14 projects have uh, fallen into these general categories. Uh, next slide. I'll turn now to some examples. I know we're running a little short on time. Uh, so the first project is an emergency department post-overdose outreach program run by the Mobile Integrated Health Division at Grady Memorial Hospital in Georgia. So individuals who present with an overdose at Grady are approached by a peer specialist and offered linkage to treatment and other services. Interested individuals then receive weekly visits by the specialists for ongoing coaching support and linkage. So by the end of 2020, 49 individuals received at least one home visit, four were linked to treatment and 28 were connected to stable housing. So project tools that this uh, pilot developed, an outreach protocol, publicity flyers and evaluation tools. Next slide. The second project is a linkage to care program for individuals released from jail incarceration. It is run by Catholic Charities Care Coordination Services in New York. Anyone on medication for opioid use disorder or MOUD meets in the jail with a peer specialist to begin the linkage process. This may include linkage to community-based community MOUD provider, housing and nutritional support, job placement, and other social services. They are then followed up in the community. 
By the end of 2020, over 200 individuals enrolled in the program have met with a peer specialist post-release, and rates of self-reported non-fatal overdose were low at two weeks and one month post-release. They were 2.6% at two weeks uh, and 6.3 at one month, which is um, remarkable considering this is such a high-risk time for individuals. Uh, project tools include an implementation plan and evaluation tools. Next slide. So the third project is an overdose education naloxone distribution program for incarcerated individuals run by North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition in North Carolina. Individuals receive overdose education prior to release from jail, followed by receipt of naloxone in their personal property at the time of release. A naloxone is packaged with contact information for treatment and recovery support services. Of the 209 individuals trained between uh, 2019 to 2020, three force had never received overdose prevention training before, which speaks to the need for this type of intervention. Project tools include a training curriculum, a readiness assessment for jail administrators, and a sample MOU with sheriffs and evaluation tools. Next slide. So based on the evaluation reports that came in, we've identified some lessons learned for implementing pilot projects for dose overdose for post overdose outreach when referrals are few, querying, uh, referring EMS and hospital personnel to identify barriers. When enrollment is low, ensure that the mission and services offered appeal to individuals regardless of their readiness to engage in drug treatment. So for a linkage to care program, um, providing re-entry wraparound services, so from jail, um, the lesson to use remote technologies for engaging individuals when social distancing guidelines are in place. And finally, for a jail-based overdose education and the Luxor distribution program to train correctional officers in the value of this intervention. If you're finding few of the uh, incarcerated individuals agree to taking the training. So next slide. With that, we conclude. Um, and thank you all for, for joining us today. I don't know if we can take time for questions. Um, there is like a little bit of buffer period, but um, I did just get word from Jen and we do want to like close things up pretty close to when the end time is. I right. think people can well, also add questions later. Uh, via the chat. Yes, and please also feel free. You have our contact information and we're happy to um, answer questions over email too. So thank um, you. We did get like one question about uh, like sharing the slides. Can you post slides from the presentation in the um, chat on Whova? Yes, we can definitely do that. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Stephanie, Sasha, and Nancy. Um, again, please reach out to us. We would be happy to expand on these presentations and um, talk with you about this work and any questions that you have related to what we shared. So um, thanks everybody, have a great day.